Hello everybody and welcome to a new episode of CPE Bach in Pieces. That's the series in which you and I together deconstruct the book of Emmanuel Bach, the famous treatise on the true art of keyboard playing in bits and pieces and try to understand what he really wants to say or what he's really expressing in, within the context of its time. So in the two previous episodes we talked extensively about his temperament system so that the way Emmanuel Bach from day to day tuned his keyboard in order to play in most keys and we came to the conclusion that there is maybe a little bit of a contradiction between one sentence where he says to flatten out most fifths so to narrow most fifths not all of them and another passage where he says well it's necessary to have a temperament in which all keys are equally pure, gleich rein. So this contradiction, since if you have a temperament system where all keys are gleich rein, equally pure, that would require, of course, having all fifths flattened a little bit, like, for instance, the 17-7 Werkmeister Harmon uh, Waltemperita Harmonia. We've been talking on that also in other videos. I will link them here on screen. You can click on them if you want to find out more on that. So this apparent contradiction, as we saw in the second episode, where we demonstrated, I demonstrated my view on the CPE Bach tuning practically here at the clavichord, turns out to be a very small difference in reality. On paper, numbers look different, but in reality, if you apply a temperament on an instrument, it's always finding a kind of balance. And even if you want to tune your instrument in the World Temperita Harmonia, uh, which is prescribed by Wegmeister, if you would like to play every day in 24 keys, like I'm doing, in applying in my instrument, it's difficult to say if you, if you tune by ear, which is the only mean I believe to tune a period instrument properly, we have to hear the intervals, then it's hard to say exactly if all fifths are flattened, exactly one twelfth or just nine or ten as Emmanuel Bach would suggest. So we came to a conclusion that overall Bach was very close to what we today would call an equal temperament, but he wanted to have probably some keys, I'll give some keys a little bit of an advantage, which I can really understand, and I know other keyboard players and instrument builders who do the same. Anyway, if we today look to CPE Bach's tuning as um, a an example where he advocates an unequal tuning, like for instance Werkmeister 3, I think that's the bridge too far. Uh, CPE Bach clearly fits into the context of its time where since almost 50 years before his publication of his book, um, you can read over and over abundantly actually in three times is that if you want to expound your keys at the keyboard, you have to compromise the temperament. And if you want to go all the way to playing 24 keys, then you have to apply a system in which all keys are gleich rein, equally pure. And with that, CPE Bach connects really fits into that context. So, and at the end of the episode, I recorded in the chapel here nearby with candlelight, it was fun to do by the way. We touched upon the person of Bartolt Fritz. Bartolt Fritz published in 1756 a book, and I read the title in German, Anweisung wie man Klaviere, Klavesin und Orgeln nach einer mechanischen Art in allen zwölf Tonen gleich rein stimmen können, dass auch solchem allen sowohl dur als mal wohlklingend zu spielen sei. And in my own uh, translation, a treatise on how to tune clavichords, harpsichords and organs in an obvious way with all 12 tones tuned equally pure so that one can play harmonious in all major and minor keys. So again, the translation is mine and also the term, since the term clavicense mentioned in the title uh, explicitly, we can assume 
almost with 100% certainty that here the term clavier is used as its prime understanding as a clavichord. The reason that I touch upon Bartold Fritsch in this last episode on CPE Bach and Temperament, next we will move to other subjects, is because the little book that um, Bartold Fritsch published in 1765 had a a considerable success. It was not only published also in Dutch. I have a facsimile of the Dutch translation, 18th century translation, also into English, but it um, had several reprints in Germany as well. One of them, the second edition, being published six months after the release of the first publication. And interestingly enough, in the second publication, the book uh, had a new preface, had a new uh, dedication was dedicated to C.P.E. Bach now. And that preface is interesting enough to read uh, fully. I will read it to you in German and I will come and summarize it next into English. So in German it sounds like this, the preface of the second edition of Bartold Fritz's book on temperament. Die versuchliche Verdienste und Wissenschaften, welche euer Hochedlen, that's Immanuel Bach, überhaupt in der Musik und im Besonderen in einem überaus fertigen und gründlichen Klavierspielen als ein ihrer vier Mal übrigens angegriffen hat, ist es an sich schon seitdem in die Nähe der Anlagen zu schreiben zu sein. Er hat außerdem vor einigen Jahren zu viel Zeit gekostet, um auch in Braunschweig einmal in Wien als Braunschweig. Uh, 1st of October 1756. So in short, Fritz dedicates the work to Emmanuel Bach, saying that a few years ago Bach visited his, his workshop in Braunschweig to play one of his latest big clavichords. And Fritz votes that in the presence of Emmanuel Bach, he retuned the instrument, he increased the pitch by a quarter of a tone, and after which Bach played on the instrument and said that it was that the temperament in which he played gave him satisfaction to play in all keys. So that's an important statement. Now let's leave that story for a while, for a few seconds, and give some background information on Bartol Fritz in case you would not know who Bartol Fritz was. He was is actually considered as one of the major instrument builders in that period of time. He was born in 1797, so we must realize he was almost by 20 years the elder of Emmanuel Bach. He died in 1766, so all of this publication of the book and everything around that happened at the end of his life. He built over 500 clavichords, which is really a lot. He built also harpsichords and pianofortes and also musical instruments, so mechanical instruments. Um, so again, he was considered to be a very important instrument builder. Uh, only the fact that Emmanuel Bach would have visited his workshop uh, proves that. And that visit is really unique and really interesting. And I believe you could see that as a normal kind of visit as we today as musicians. I mean, if we um, uh, meet an instrument builder as a musician, the first thing to ask is if there's something new in the workshop to be seen. And if that's the case, often appointments are made and the musician visit the workshop of the instrument builder and they're actually one of the most enjoyable things that uh, you can have in life as a musician is um, actually happening. That's playing a new instrument in the presence of the builder and the musician gets new impulses, new ideas, inspiration and the builder gets feedback directly from, uh, from a musician. So this kind of relationship is something, of course, that you would only have if you can meet a person who builds instruments, which is by definition almost period instruments. You will not have it while vi visiting the Steinme factory, which can be very interesting, but there is not one person who makes those instruments, or there's not a small dedicated um, a team of people who makes those instruments, but that's another story. And so I can imagine that Emmanuel Bach visited the workshop of Bartold Fritsch in the same uh, spirit as we today would do. Interesting also is the fact that uh, Bartold Fritsch uh, describes the instrument as a big clavier. And in my understanding, that's almost for 100% certainty a clavichord, a big clavichord. We have seen in the title that Fritz makes a distinction between clavier and clavecin. So he uses 
most probably, if not certainly, the term clavier in the prime understanding as clavichord. So that's one element that contributes to the understanding of big clavier as big clavichord, but also the term big is not something you would expect to be used with the clavic with the harpsichord. Big in clavichord means an unfretted, most probably five octave instruments, instrument clavichord, which Fritz built a lot of. So but anyway, that big clavichord, that big instrument was raised a quarter of a tone while Emmanuel Bach was in the workshop. And if you're not too familiar with instrument building, this can sound a little bit weird, a little bit as if this is a kind of um, thing that was not right with the instrument. What it really tells, and that's also the reason perhaps why Bartol Fritz implements that in his preface of his book, is that this instrument was brand new. If an instrument is new, if it's strung only recently, the pitch will fall down constantly. You will have to increase the pitch uh, a few times a day, even the first days, to have it to give the instrument a kind of stability. So what this indicates to me is that that clavichord was really brand new. So he raised the pitch a quarter of a tone, which is a smart thing to do. Probably the instrument needed that, but it's a smart thing to do as well, because if you want to provide an instrument with the kind of stability that works on the short term, you have to raise the pitch. Um, uh, you cannot lower the pitch because then it loses its stability. So he raised the pitch a quarter of a tone and then applied his temperament system to that instrument. And that temperament system is, in, in fact, very simple. It's explained in the book that you lower all fifths one twelfth. And basically, that's what he is talking about. So it ties in perfectly to the Voltemperierte Harmonia 17.7 Werkmeister. Bartol Fritz gives a lot of practical information about how to achieve this temperament very easily. I will not go to, into detail here. And it's important to realize that if he applied that temperament, which we can be sure about because the book is about that temperament system that he used when Emmanuel Bach was in his workshop, um, then it's the only question that remains if the story is true. It's a pity that the letters of C.B. Bach give us no solution on that since they only start regularly from mid-60s. So we don't have letters of C.B. Bach to Bartol Fritz that proves this. On the other hand, this was a public publication of a very respected uh, instrument builder, a publication uh, moreover that had a big impact and there are no signs that Emmanuel Bach opposed to the dedication, nor that he would oppose to the content of this. And that, again, should not surprise us, since his own temperament, his day-to-day -day temperament, is very close to this. And by the way, Emmanuel Bach gives us no clue to what a very strict 24 keys temperament would be like maybe 12, 12 fifths would be tempered. But again, who is using all the 24 keys every day? That's something we should um, make ourselves wonder as well. To summarize, Bartolt Fritz gives us, I believe, a unique insight in what is a daily day out of the life of CPE Bach, just taking the time, visiting a workshop of an instrument builder, trying an instrument out, having a discussion or having a conversation with the instrument builder. And again, that is still today one of the most valuable aspects of being a musician playing period instruments, the contact that you can have with instrument builders. And whether or not this is true, it fits into the story of what Emmanuel Bach is uh, communicating with us in his own book on temperament. There is a slight difference, but overall it fits into that, con to the context of the time where all theoretical writings you read about temperament, they say the same, that if you want to expand your keys, of the, your, the keys in which you would like to play, you have to compromise temperament. Going up to 24 keys, where you, of course, have the most com compromised temperament, which is kind of equal temperament. So yes, one loses the characteristics of the keys 
by much. There is no such thing anymore than a quality of a third that can be connected to a kind of characteristics of the keys. But I've been saying this for a long time. I don't find any source that confirms the fact that there is a relationship between the quality of the third or the temperament in general, because those two are, of course, related to each other, and the characteristics of the keys. I have the feeling that this is a kind of neo-baroque invention that is not based upon historical sources. It's actually the opposite that is true, that in order to expand again uh, the keys in which you want to play on a keyboard, you lose all differentiations between the keys because that's what you want to do. And even going as far as to Schubert, who wrote about the key characteristics, I believe that was published in 1806, there you will not find a connection between that and the temperament. You can also um, add it the work by Gottlob Turk, uh, which he wrote in 1789, uh, History Ties on Keyboard Playing, in which he says the Waltemperite Clavier playing in 24 keys. I don't think he talks about the Waltemperite Clavier, but he talks about 24 keys. He advocates strongly also for equal temperament. And he, interestingly enough, says, surprisingly, the differences between the keys are still there, not in a relationship of the quality of thirds or not in the relationship with the quality of the quarter and the fifth intervals, but there is a kind of feeling of differences. If you play an E flat minor, you play in a different way than if you play an E minor because your hands are in a different position on the keyboard. At least that is a free uh, um, uh, a translation of what he is describing in his book. So. I believe with this we can close the chapters on temperament uh, with C.P.E. Bach. I believe this was also for me a very interesting uh, research. Happy that I've dived into that extensively. Um, and I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. So for next chapters on C.P.E. Bach in Pieces, we will go to another chapter. We might talk in next episode about the way he saw a musician and what a musician should be able to do and what not. And there are some interesting lessons to be drawn from that, uh, also appeal, uh, applying to myself. That's for next time. Anyway, if this is your first time here on Authentic Sound, I'd love to have you subscribed. Hit that subscribe button and also the bell icon next to that so you stay on top of everything we do. And you get also notifications for the live streams, which might be interesting for you to follow if you've not been there already. It's a wonderful way to interact with each other, you and I, but also amongst you as viewers of Authentic Sound. The chat on the live stream is, I think, for many people now, one of the most enjoyable things when I do my best to entertain you and to teach you something. So I would be happy to see you one day in the live streams as on the other videos. So thanks again for watching and we see each other very soon again.